our speaker for today. So our speaker is Laurent Laduce. He is a writer and a journalist. He works uh, with the family and rural activities in Benin of West Africa. He is a great uncle. He is a loving, friendly guy. I had a chance to meet him in uh, Austria for a few days, and uh, he's very inspiring. So he's going to help us learn more about uh, the introduction of the divine principle and answer all of our questions about the meaning of life and more. So without further ado, please help me to welcome Laurent Laduce. Laurent, the stage is yours. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm talking from Paris. And uh, so I'm glad we have this meeting tonight. I'll share my screen uh, to present the general introduction of the uh, divine principle. Sorry, yes, I hope you can see. Uh, I've been knowing this teaching for uh, about 50 years and I'm still uh, studying it to understand and to practice. It starts saying that everyone is struggling to attain happiness and avoid misfortune. And then we ask the question, uh, how does happiness arise? The answer is people feel joy when their desires are fulfilled. Recently, it came to my mind that this emphasis on everyone is important. The, this book starts with everyone, every human being. And uh, I have come to the conclusion that this teaching is kind of a love letter from God to every person on earth. It's not for very specific people, VIPs, or for the Christian, for those who believe or whatever. It's for every person, the man or the woman on the street. Uh, the founder of this movement, Reverend Moon, uh, one time he, he, he said the following, when you encounter any man on earth, you must value him and realize that I have come just to save that man. You must feel that love and closeness for the most insignificant man. Remember that I came for him and value him just as much as you value me. When you feel that deeply about someone, if it does not come for a few days, uh, you will not be able to control yourself in your urgency to see him. In my life, I met many um, strangers in any place, sometimes in planes or in trains or whatever. And sometimes we had nothing to say, but many times I had very deep encounters with people whom I had never met before. I believe that this emphasis on everyone is true. The Bible says, after all, God so loved the world. And uh, the Mrs. Moon, whom we call uh, the uh, Mother Moon sometimes, she always talked about the 7.8 billion people living on earth. When we um, study the Bible, the Old Testament, really talks a lot about God, the creator. It's a, a revelation about God Almighty, about Jehovah. And uh, so God is really the center of the uh, history of Israel. When we open the New Testament, the emphasis is very much on Jesus, Jesus Christ. Of course, it talks about God too, but the center of the gospel is a man called Jesus. I would say that the center of this teaching, the divine principle, is every one of us. I see it as a revelation about every person on earth today, the common man. We all are called to relate to God and to build what we call channel book, the kingdom of God. We are not the only one to stress about the importance of everyone. There is a famous play of an Austrian playwright, Hugo von Hofmannsthal. He was a co-founder of the Salzburg Festival. His favorite play is called Jedermann. Jedermann is uh, the German word for everyone. And in this play, Jedermann, the main character, suddenly faces death, which wants to bring him in the presence of his creator. 
He needs someone to witness about his goodness, but no one wants to, want, no one wants to accompany him. Only his good deeds and his pure faith can make of him a good man and thus save him from eternal damnation. This character could be any one of us. It's a person facing what we sometimes call judgment. I am on the good side or the evil side. Shall I meet God or not? It's, a, it's not about a special person. It's about everyone's dilemma in life, whether you believe or not. Also, uh, the emphasis on every man or the common man is a central piece of a very famous speech of Henry Wallace. He was a vice president of America under Roosevelt during the World War II. And he gave a speech on May the 8th, 1942, called the century of the common man. He said that this is not the era of heroes anymore, but of the everyday person. And in this speech, he said the following, Satan is now trying to lead the common man of the whole world back into slavery and darkness. Some have spoken of the American century. I say that the century on which we are entering, the century which will come into being after this war, can be and must be the century of the common man. So today we talk about the desire of happiness of this average person, everybody. When Wallace gave his speech, he inspired a great American composer called Aaron Copland, who composed the fanfare for the common man. We can hear one minute of this fanfare, if we can play now. Possible, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, we can stop the music. Yeah, yeah. So I share my screen again. Yeah, okay. So uh, I don't know if you knew this music of Aaron Copland. It celebrates each one of us, and I would say I would desire to be happy. Um, so we said that. We want to be happy, okay? But the word desire, however, is often not understood in its original sense because in the present circumstances, our desires tend to pursue evil rather than good. The original mind is well aware that the desire pursuing evil lead to misfortune. So we are struggling. We are in a kind of tragic situation. Therefore, it, it repels evil's desires and strives to follow the good. Even at the cost of their lives, people seek for the joy that can enrapture the original mind. We all are searching for a meaningful joy, and we find it quite difficult because there is kind of an enemy inside, which is our own desire. We are all struggling with that, aren't we? Within the self-same individual are two opposing inclinations, the original mind, which desires goodness, and the evil mind, which desires wickedness. Uh, Hugo Hofmannsthal was living at the time when psychoanalysis was very fashionable. He studied the theory of Sigmund Freud, and Freud was very much aware of this contradiction in our life. He said that we are torn between different kinds of desires. He was not religious at all, but he read the same conclusion. This is called a human contradiction. So we say that the two minds within us are engaged in a fierce battle, striving to accomplish two conflicting purposes. 
this human contradiction is much more serious than any civil war or any war because it's a whole time, a lifetime war within us. And this is the beginning of Reverend Moon's search for answers. He came to the conclusion that any being possessing such a contradiction within itself is doomed to perish. We cannot be uh, cool about that. Uh, it's kind of a tragic situation. So we've got to be serious. And that's why spirituality has appeared to deal with this kind of thing. Human beings having acquired this contradiction live in the state of destruction. It's true that sometimes religion may, be, may look a little bit pessimistic because it emphasizes our dark side. But in my opinion, religion is helping us not live in illusion. We have a problem. We're a little bit sick. And it's better to go and see the doctor because otherwise we will live in illusion all our life. Um, if burdened by such a contradiction from its inception, however, human life would not have been able to arise. The contradiction, therefore, must have developed after the birth of the human race. Reverend Moon, when he was young, became convinced that God could never create us with such a contradiction. A God of goodness cannot enjoy seeing human beings struggling like that. Therefore, it is not the human condition. It is something which is a result of what we call the human fall. We are not going to study the human fall today, but it's a very important part of this teaching. When we realize the fact that we have arrived at the brink of self-destruction, we make desperate efforts to resolve the contradiction by repelling evil desires and embracing good desires. Easy to say, not easy to do. Every year we have resolutions to change our lifestyle and we believe we can do. And we often see that there is so much power within us which prevents us from uh, fulfilling our resolution. Sometimes we manage to change our life, but often we feel so burdened by problems within. And here we say we have been unable to find the ultimate answer to the question, what the nature of good and evil? Not only we are people of contradiction, but we live in ignorance. We really don't know where it comes from. Considered from the viewpoint of the intellect, the human fall represents humanity's descent into ignorance. People are composed of two aspects, internal and external, or mind and body. Likewise, the intellect consists of two aspects, internal and external. In the same way, there are two types of ignorance, internal ignorance and external ignorance. When I was young, before I met this teaching, uh, I didn't know God at all. I studied only science and humanities. I was very much into literature and philosophy. I knew nothing about religion. Uh, I cannot say that I was uh, an atheist because I believe there must be something, but I had no religious education and I was not searching for anything religious. Suddenly I discovered God through this teaching and I started to seek internal truth. Internal ignorance in religious terms is spiritual ignorance. It's not being able to answer very fundamental questions about the meaning of life. Why is there a universe? Does God exist? Is there a life after death? This kind of things. External ignorance refers to ignorance of the natural world, including the human body. So we have to find the answers about the natural laws, the law of gravitation or many kind of laws, you know. From the dawn of history until today, human beings have ceaselessly searched for the truth which bring, with which to overcome both types of ignorance and attain knowledge. So the divine principle is searching for balance. We need to overcome two types of ignorance. I'm now having activities in Africa, and I realize that when I go there, I have to combine spiritual and practical guidance for the people because they have spiritual needs like all of us, but they have many physical needs also. 
And I cannot just tell them, well, you can pray about that. I have to come up with solutions. Humanity through religion has followed the path of searching for internal truth. But you know, there is no, no agreement among religion. This is a problem. And through science has followed the path of seeking external truth. There is much more agreement on the scientific side. Of course, there are also controversies in science, but science generally brings people together like the law of physics or chemistry or whatever, what we call exact sciences. There is generally a consensus. So uh, this emphasis on religion and science is supported by a research which was done by Michael Hart in 1977. He was searching for the 10 most influential people in human history. And uh, when his um, uh, research was done, there were a few questions. Can we believe this? And uh, other researchers have done the same and it's about the same results. According to him, the most influential person ever on earth was Muhammad. He doesn't mean the greatest, but the man who today has the most influence on the daily life of people. Second is Isaac Newton, then comes Jesus Christ, Buddha, Confucius, Apostle Paul, then Tsai Lun, the Chinese man who invented paper, Johann Gutenberg who invented printing, Christopher Columbus who discovered the new world, America, and Albert Einstein. It seems to confirm what we just said. The people most influential are five men of internal quest, religion and spirituality, and five men of external quest, science, discovery, exploration. As you can see here, no man of conquest is on the top 10, like political or military leaders or even artists. They don't belong to the top 10. The most important, most influential are those who are searching for the truth, either through religion or through science. Is it relevant? I think it is. You know, we can see that external empires vanish, but influence is stronger than power, and the word is mightier than sword. Spiritual empires are permanent. There are people um, of the light, both on the internal and external side, who started to search for the truth long ago. The Roman Empire has disappeared, the Persian Empire, all the empires have disappeared, but the spiritual empires are still alive. Christianity is alive, Islam is alive, Buddhism is alive. It seems that they cannot be destroyed at all. They are maintained from century to century, likewise the power of science. In the daily life, we turn to scripture, to spiritual laws, to tradition in order to find internal joy. And we turn to science, and physical laws, techniques, and regulations to find happiness. So there are people of conscience and people of science uh, who influence all of us today. The people of conscience are eager to connect to heaven, to something above them, something like a plus. Their first thought is to pray, to turn their hearts to God out of reverence for the creator. People of science are more down to earth, I would say. They, they feel connected to the earth, to the daily existence. But there is no contradiction here because ideally heaven, human beings and the earth should be one. So on the one hand, I exist for something higher than myself. But on the other hand, and then I have questions such as why, what for, who? which are very philosophical questions, but we also have external questions because we are attracted by the world. We want to study what the world is. We have so much curiosity and both are needed. We, we have questions about the what, the how, the where, and the when. So people of conscience are working on themselves. They try to live a good life, to embody the true, the beautiful, and the good within. People of science, are seeking these values outside. Of course, they don't neglect becoming good people, but they try to find what is true, what is beautiful, what is good without in the nature. 
So one is the internal desire and quest. The other is external desire and quest. And the divine principle says that we need both to arrive at complete happiness. So the, the inquiry made by this man in 77 is, is very wise. Actually, everybody, everyone on earth has both kind of questions. We cannot rely only on religion and only on science. We need an integrated approach because we want to have a meaningful happiness. I'd not insist on this slide, it would be very complicated. Eventually, the way of religion and the way of science should be integrated and their problems resolved in one united undertaking. The two aspects of truth, internal and external, should develop in full consonance. Only then, completely liberated from ignorance and living solely in goodness, will we enjoy eternal happiness. So it's very good that uh, the CARP is a, a movement of young people who embraces both disciplines. We highly regard uh, students interested in, uh, you know, theology and philosophy and literature, searching for a meaning, as well as those who search for science and technology. We need both to create a better society, to live in a better world. Both are needed. We can discern two broad courses in the search for solutions to the fundamental questions of human life. In the first, people have searched within the resultant material world. In the second, people have attempted to transcend the resultant world of phenomena and search in the world of essence. Religion and science, setting out with the missions of dispelling the two aspects of human ignorance, have seen the course of the development to take positions that were contradictory and irreconcilable. But in the CARP, we say that there must be a solution. Religions do not have all the answers, nor does science have. We need an integrated approach to, for mankind to completely overcome the two aspects of ignorance and fully realize the goodness which the original mind desires. At some point in history, there must emerge a new truth which can reconcile religion and science and resolve their problems in an integrated undertaking. So here we are asking a few questions. What missions must the new truth fulfill? Well, it must enable all people to overcome the two types of ignorance, internal and external, and fully comprehend the two types of knowledge. This is a very important task. Second, um, it should lead fallen people away from evil ways and towards the attainment of goodness by enabling them to remove the contradiction of good and evil. There are successful uh, attempts to help people uh, becoming better. There are many stories of psychologists or religious leaders who are able to save people's lives in a dramatic way. People who were criminals, who had very bad lives, their life could be transformed. Some of them could become saints or very good people. There are many stories of redemption. And often it's a combination of spirituality and scientific knowledge. So religion should not disregard fields of psychology or medicine because it's very helpful. Another point, it should be able to reveal the reality and heart of God, his heart of joy at the time of creation, his broken heart he felt when humankind, his children, whom he could not abandon, rebel against him and his heart of striving to save them. I have to tell you that when I first heard this, I could not understand. What do we call the heart of God? It was very strange for me. I had no idea that God is a personal God. It was very disturbing for me, especially to be able to pray. I had never prayed in my life. It was very awesome for me because how can I talk to an invisible creator? But I have to say that the deepest experiences in my life were 
experiencing the heart of God very deeply. It took me some time, but I had many occasions when I had an overflow of tears. I tell you, it's very dramatic. In the Middle Age, it was called the gift of tears. There were many saints like uh, Saint Katharina of Siena or Saint Teresa of Avila and others. They had so many tears for humankind. It's like a tempest of tears often. It's not crying for psychological reasons, but weeping very deeply for the redemption of human beings. If you read the works of Dostoevsky, for example, people often cry very deeply from the bottom of their heart. Also Tolstoy has such characters because they felt that the world will not change just with reason, with good resolutions. We must have such a strong desire to save the world from hell. So I hope you will enjoy studying uh, this teaching, the divine principle. We say that in order for God's providence of salvation to be completely fulfilled, this new truth should first elevate the idealism of the democratic world to a new level, then use it to assimilate materialism and finally bring humanity into a new world. This truth must be able to embrace all historical religions, ideologies and philosophies and bring complete unity among them. You may think it's so ambitious. Can we really do that? Well, I think we should try. Uh, you know, this is called the research of principle. So we don't pretend to have all the answers, but we are on the way to think about it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Laurent Ladouz. And uh, very inspiring to listen to you. And uh, I think through listening, just more questions came up. <laughs> but uh, that's a good thing. So um, yeah, what is the purpose of life and how to reach this happiness? You know, there's struggles uh, with uh, our quest for goodness, but we sometimes uh, find the easier ways to achieve this happiness through doing something uh, that is also mixed with a little bit of evilness and uh, understanding the heart of God that is also for me like wow if God has a heart then what is it like because when you look at uh, the world around us there's a lot of things going on a lot of people and a lot of them are suffering so I think if we can understand that then uh, we can also understand many things that are going on in around the world. Um, so thank you so much for the introduction. And uh, I'm sure a lot of you also have just more questions through listening. So I'll read of some, some of the questions we have. And then okay. um, if anyone else also has a question, you can raise your hand. Uh, so the first question is, since we have an... Uh, evil and original mind, does evil have to exist for good to exist too, just like day and night? So, uh, uh, how does that work? Yeah, uh, we have no time to explore this question. Um, the divine principle very clearly says that uh, good and evil are not complementary, like day and night or internal or external. They repel each other. In other words, uh, evil is not teaching any, anything. We, we have to graduate from evil habits, but um, evil makes our conscience very confused. The only thing a person who was doing bad things can do then is to help others get out of it. For example, people were in drugs, you know, and they were severely damaged by this, but they will have a desire based on their experience, to save other people in the same condition. Um, in the movement called Alcoholic Anonymous, I have studied this movement, um, they say that a person should go from minus six to zero. For example, absolute alcoholism. You, you, you drink all, all your day, you're drinking. And then you have to become sober. You have to give up drinking. But they say it's not enough. 
a person who would not drink, who would be sober, would be also empty. So then they say a person has to go from minus six to zero and from zero to plus six, has to grow in goodness. It's not enough not to do evil. It actually, it's not interesting. And Jesus said that People should not have too many commandments from now on. There are so many commandments in Judaism. Jesus said, it's not needed. You need two positive commandments. Love God, love your neighbor as yourself. People said, what about the other commandments? We don't need that anymore. Jesus said, no. <laughs> All these negative commandments, you should not do this or should not do that. You don't need that anymore. Just live a good life from now. He even said, please be perfect. Ooh, that was very challenging. People didn't like so much. <laughs> Sometimes we prefer to keep fighting our bad habits, but when we are given a clear responsibility to do good things, it can be very challenging. People are not jumping on positive responsibilities, doing good the whole day. <laughs> Sometimes it's difficult, but we have to go for that. Thank you so much. Brilliant answer. And uh, yeah, I can also connect to a story when uh, Jesus was uh, saying that he, there was a rich man who gave a golden coin to three of his uh, disciples. So one of them buried it, one of it uh, <laughs> exchanged mm -hmm. it, and one of it made even more money out of it. So yes, uh, similarly with the goodness, you should. Uh, expect your child to not just stay at home and not do anything but to even do something positive like clean the house or make something nice for everyone to eat so yeah, yeah that's brilliant answer thank mm. you and we have one more question how can i distinguish between my good and bad thoughts how do i know i'm doing something bad or something good oh i think it's a very good question um there are many ways and um, I think the first thing is a person should try to find the answer by himself. Uh, because, of course, you can ask someone or you can read, but then you may not be very convinced. So I think, first of all, a person has to make investigation why he believes his ideas are good or not. If the person is religious, he will pray. And maybe God will not answer very directly. It, it rarely happens so that God gives you a very clear answer. The answer may come very unexpectedly. For example, in a very unnoticed way, you, you, you ask for a question and suddenly during a conversation, a person will give you the answer. It can even be your enemy. <laughs> It happened to me that sometimes I was struggling to find answers to my questions. And the answer did not come from my friends. The answer came from the people I would never listen to because I, I'm stubborn. I don't listen to <laughs> people who, who are my enemies, if I say so. And sometimes the answers to my question came from people whom I don't like so much or I don't like to listen to them. And they told me the right thing to do. Yeah. So uh, we have to, as, as a religious person, we should be very humble. We have to listen to everyone. But before we listen to anyone, again, better find, if possible, by yourself. What is good? What is evil within in me? Why do I think this way? And we should not give up. Sometimes an idea can be a little bit foolish, but it's not completely foolish either. It, it may contain some truth. Huh? So people should not give up their ideas. Huh? You can talk very honestly. You can test the people and say, I'm not really satisfied by your answer. I will consult somebody else. Huh? So we have to arrive at a, a complete answer to our questions. We should not be afraid of questioning. Yeah. Thank you so much for that answer. Yeah, <laughs> definitely also good 
first of all, to think within yourself. And then if you share that thought you have with someone else and you see their reaction, oh, that's actually a great idea what you have, or mm. they can say, um, maybe that's a bit selfish. So if your thoughts are more centered towards yourself, I think it's also a little bit easy to, to sure. point that they are more evil if they're self-centered. If, and if it's a thought that you can help other people, then usually that will lead towards goodness. Mm. Mm. So we have one more question. Um, what does the divine principle add to Christianity? Uh, it's not so easy to say. The Bible is a book um, which seems to be complete. Some passages of the Bible seem to suggest that we should not touch the Holy Bible. It's complete. We should not add even one iota. We must respect this. At the same time, the same book, the same Bible says that there is something new to come. Even Jesus said that he did not reveal everything yet. And throughout Christianity, there have been many reformations, not only with Martin Luther, but with others. And today, there are many questions in theology. Uh, the divine principle is uh, asking new questions before it, uh, it brings new answers. It's asking very new questions, for example, about the fall. Hmm? There have been many questions about the fall, but some questions were never asked. And Reverend Moon asked those questions. And it, because he was asking new questions, he arrived at unprecedented answers. Now, his tone was always, I would not say diplomatic, but he's very careful not to hurt anyone. For example, in some chapters it says, some people have believed this way. It's admirable. It's a good belief to, to say this and that. We don't disagree with that. The problem is the Bible contains some verses which may not agree with this belief, this teaching. So we don't try to confront people to say, oh, this is so wrong, you know, what your belief is very strange. We never say that. We respect every belief and we discuss honestly. And first of all, we ask questions to people. Okay, you believe this. I also believe partly the same thing as you, but I have a few questions to ask you. Is that the way we try to, to do? I hope we do well. Sometimes we may hurt some other people and we should not. We should never offend someone who believes differently. It's very wrong. We have to learn from every tradition. Yeah. Personally, I was not a Christian before I met this movement. So I have learned from Jehovah's Witnesses. I have learned from Mormons. I have learned from evangelicals, from Muslims, from Jewish people. I always learn from them many things about my own tradition, actually. Yeah. So we, we can learn through many sources. Thank you so much for answering. And uh, yeah, I think if, if there is a, a higher um, level of uh, studying or teaching that can help us become better people, then um, definitely people would like to improve if you have a smartphone that is a Galaxy 8. Uh, so naturally, when time passes by, you would like to move on to the better version so you can uh, have a better um, phone. So similarly with our knowledge, if there is a higher truth, then we would likely to improve also and become better. Yeah. I want to add something. Um, the problem in spirituality is there are not only different understandings. Within the same tradition, people are more or less mature. Uh, you will see, for example, in Christianity, people who live with so much guilt and uh, they cannot liberate themselves from very heavy burdens. For them, religion is only duty. Uh, they are afraid of hell. They, uh, they are pessimistic, I would say. But within the same religion, within the same Christianity, you have very joyful Christians. Hmm? 
they believe in the same thing, but it's a different level. Some people are still, uh, in our jargon, we say they are servants of God. They serve God as their best, but they don't have the heart of a child yet. And uh, it's, it, sometimes it takes time for a person because this person may have much resentment, anger, and cannot easily accept that God is a parent. It's a very difficult step. And uh, so within the same religion, there are so many levels. There is now this discussion in Muslims, among Muslims, because some Muslims believe things literally, you know, that they take everything in the Quran as literal. But some Imams say it's wrong. There are many things in the Quran which should be placed in context. Seeing that Muhammad said like uh, 1,500 years ago, today they must be adapted. There are debates in Islam today, but some people are so narrow-minded, they are not yet open to this questioning. Even among those who follow Reverend Moon's teaching, there are different levels. Sometimes we I myself, I can be very rigid on some opinions. I don't give up ideas easily. <laughs> so, sometimes I'm very stubborn, I have to say, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I think this will be the last question for now and we will be dividing into groups. Um, so we'll have discussion within the group and we'll have some questions for all of you in the chat. So you can discuss these questions in the chat. And uh, we'll be back here in around 15 minutes. So each uh, group will have 15 minutes to share and discuss. And uh, yeah, the questions are right now on the chat. So you can all open the chat and see the questions. So question number one is, do you sometimes feel the contradiction that Mr. Laduce was talking about to um, to want to do good but tempted by the evil mind. What can we do to follow goodness? Number two, in your opinion, how can we find true and long lasting happiness? What do we have to do for that? And number three, what do you think about the personal God, Mr. Ladus was sharing about how did you view God before hearing this? So you will be answering these questions together. You can share together with your friends or the people you will meet. So it's quite exciting to meet also new people. So I have you, I hope you have a great discussion and we'll see you here in 15 minutes. All right. Have a great time together. And yeah, you just need to click join for the group discussion. So people are flowing back into our room. Welcome back everyone. I hope you had a great discussion. I definitely had a very nice discussion having also Laurent Laduce with me. <laughs> So it was really nice. And uh, yes, we will have some announcements before we conclude. So first of all, we're going to um, have another meeting on the 11th of October. So the topic will be believing in God in the 21st century. And it will be very exciting. So I'm already... Um, suggesting you write it down in your calendar and uh, set the time. It will be eight o'clock, eight o'clock in the evening, in uh, according to Central European time. So here in Israel, that would be nine o'clock. But for people in Europe, that will be eight o'clock in the evening. And then we have one more announcement. Um, so if you have any more questions and you're interested to learn more, then we have our website, carpume, uh, info, uh, gmail.com. And also um, we have our WhatsApp chat, so you can uh, connect to that and uh, our Instagram. So you can uh, join our Instagram page and 
Uh, we always post things there, so you can get more information there as well. And I think that that's it. So if you have any friends who you would like to invite also, then feel free, you can uh, invite them through the Instagram page and we'll be very happy to always see more people here. So thank you everyone for joining. It was really inspiring and refreshing and I hope you also had a great time or you could maybe write a few points you could learn today. And we'll see you very soon again on uh, October 11th. So write that down and uh, I'm looking forward to see you all. Um, all right, so this is it for tonight. Thank you once again for Laurent Ledoux. We can all give him a round of applause. And thank you for our Carpenter International team. And yeah, 